Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC 308. Um, we are joining now through the book of Revelation and um, we are looking at these seven churches. Let's pick up in Revelation chapter 2 verse 18 please. Now we've got um, almost 11 verses to read with this next church, the church at Thyatira. Um, so let's, uh, a few of us can take turns to read it, three verses each. Let's start with verse 18, please. Revelation sir, chapter 2. Please go on, ma'am. Please, uh, Anni. Okay, thank you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you, are, because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immoral immorality and eat things sacrificed to the idols, to idols. Thank you. Shall I say? Please, please. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Thank you. Somebody else, verse 24, please. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Titera, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the death of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces, like the potter's vessel. As I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm. Thank you. So, verse 18, the Lord Jesus is introducing himself to the church in Thyatira. He is the Son of God, you know, declaring his place of uh, authority, dominion, as the one to whom all authority is given, the Son of God, his eyes like flaming fire, the eyes that refines, tests, examines everything and his feet like fine brass not brass in scripture is often used to talk about judgment um you know uh, dominion judgment so brass his feet like brass fine like brass and then he tells the church in Thyatira, you know there's you know he commends them for all the good things you'll see that you know in every church yeah, there are good things there they good things in every church he commends them you know their works the love, a lot of good things, love, service or ministry, their faith, their endurance, and their works are growing. So, you know, a lot of good things are happening in this church. Uh, as the, and you will notice that the Lord tends to point out the good things in every church, meaning he's observant of these things. And he commends the people for the good things that are going on. So here's a church where good things are happening. But there are some problems. 
And once again, in this church in Titan, I just like the previous church in Pogamos. <coughs> sorry. It has to do with what they are tolerating happening in the church. We saw in the, in the church in Pergamos, they were tolerating people who were bringing in wrong doctrine, the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Similarly, in the church in Thyatira, it was a very good church. What a good list, you know. They have works, they have love, they have ministry, they have faith, they have endurance, and the works are growing. Very nice church. I mean, just if, if verse 19 was used to describe any one of our local churches, it would be brilliant. Wow, beautiful, wonderful church. But something's going on. They are entertaining a woman. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with it. This could have been a man also. So don't, you know, sometimes people make a lot of, a big deal about Jezebel, the prophetess. I know, you know, back in the, I think it was in the uh, 90s, there was a lot of teaching going around Jezebel spirit, Jezebel spirit and all of that. They made a big deal of it. But I mean, it's, it's, it's good to understand it, but don't just always associate a Jezebel spirit with a woman. The, the, a Jezebel spirit is basically a controlling, manipulative spirit, right? So, but here in this particular case in, in Thyatira, okay, so that controlling and manipulation could be anybody. Who can do it? It could be a man, it could be a woman, sometimes it could be even a young person, it could be even a child that's controlling and manipulating. Got, got to be careful. So the, the thing here is this, that in this particular church in Thyatira, they were entertaining, they were welcoming this person, this lady who was claiming to be a prophetess. Her name happened to be Jezebel. But what was she doing? She was teaching people to commit immorality and idolatry. Now, how could you know a local church, which was so good, love, faith, endurance, ministry, which was so good, On this side, be accommodating somebody who was blatantly doing something that was wrong. Not something, but things that were wrong. Idolatry, morality. How could that, how could, you know, how could, how could these two things coexist in such a good community of people? That's something to think about. And we, we will try to answer that. But that was the problem. This, they were tolerating this woman who was a prophetess. Yeah? So notice she calls herself a prophetess. So that means she was demonstrating and she had probably she had some sorts of prophetic expressions going on in her life. But what was she teaching? What was she telling? Or, you know, what was the ultimate influence on the lives of people? Seduction to commit immorality, idolatry. Verse 21, the Lord has given time to repent. So think about that phrase, time to repent. That means, he's saying, hey, I'm waiting for this person to straighten up. She's doing things wrong. I'm waiting for her to repent of the wrong she's doing, of the immorality that she's doing, but she hasn't repented. I've given her time. Now, how much time did the Lord give her? We don't know, right? It's not mentioned, but that means he was being patient for some, you know, for some time. But he said, look, I'm coming. He's, I'm the son of God. He's the son of God. He's the one who's with the feet of brass. He's coming for judgment. Both her and those who are committing immorality with her. Going to bring her, bring them into great tribulation judgment. So this is judgment, I'm bringing them into, you know, so in this case, they're going to face difficult, they're going to face the judgment right there in that particular church. Verse 23, I will kill her children with 
death. Now, let us think about the language the Lord is using. Her children. I will kill her children with death. Now, perhaps it referred to her natural children, but it's most likely referring to the people who have subscribed to her doctrine, her and her children. And the church that others will know that I'm the God who sees what's in the heart and the mind. And I look at the works as well. And notice verse 24. Those who have not received this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. So think about it. Verse 24. The teaching that this woman was giving was actually taking people into the very depths of Satan. That's what Jesus is saying, right? By avoiding this doctrine, they have avoided going into the depths of Satan. But if you flip it around, the people who received her teaching were actually being taken into deeper into the demonic, deeper into the devilish, deeper into the devil himself. So doctrine can either take us deeper into God or it can take us deeper into the devil. The kind of doctrine we receive. So, in this case, the people who refuse to receive her doctrine have, did not end up like the others. The others ended up in the depths of Satan. They, the people who refused her doctrine, they stood secure. And so the Lord Jesus is saying, that's all I want you to do. Just stand. Just hold on to what you have and refuse to accept the doctrine of this prophetess and that is going to make you an overcomer and verse 26 is the promise you're going to rule over nations and uh, you know basically what the Lord Jesus receives from the Father he's going to share with us he's going to receive the kingdom from the Father and we're going to rule and reign with him and he'll give us the morning star now the Lord Jesus himself is referred to as the morning star uh, we refer to we see this in Second Peter one, verse nineteen. The Lord Jesus Himself is the morning star, basically saying, "Look, you're going to share with me in my glory and in my authority in ruling and reigning on the earth." But you've got to hold on to the truth. So once again, in the church in Tahantara, we see the importance of doctrine, just like in the church in Pergamos. You know, and so it's so important for us to protect our congregations, our church communities, uh, making sure that we feed them with the right doctrine and making sure we keep uh, people out who are going to promote wrong doctrine. Now, in today's world, it is a little difficult because, uh, you know, we have access to information. You know, we can go online, we can watch videos, we can uh, read books, everything, and we don't, we can't control all of that. So, people are obviously exposed to all kinds of things everywhere, all around us, because there's so much of information and so much of access to information. So, it's easy for believers to be exposed to all kinds of things, you know, available. So, the only way we can protect believers is by establishing them in the truth. And verse 25, if they hold on to the right doctrine, they hold on to what is right. So from a leadership perspective, from a pastoral perspective, what we can do is to keep teaching people the right things, so then they know what to hold on to and what to reject. Because we can't you know, go and talk about all the wrong things out there. There's too much. So what do you do? Teach them the right things. They will hold on to that. That's all he's asking us to do. Hold on to what you have, the right things stand, you'll be an overcomer. But let's take a few minutes to try to answer this question. How could we, how could a church like the church in Thyatira, which was doing so well on one side, you know, there were people who were loving, there were people who 
were serving, they were people of faith, they were people of endurance, they had a growing ministry, they were doing so well. And yet, why would they tolerate a prophetess like Jezebel, who was having such a harmful effect on people in that community? How could that happen? Any thoughts? When I see Louis' question, we'll, we'll come to that as well in the chat. But any thoughts on this? How could such a community that is doing so well tolerate a prophetess like Jezebel to operate in their midst? And basically taking people to the depths of Satan and they're letting it happen. Any thoughts? Sir Shile, only few things. Please, please, please. I think this is because uh, the power of deceiving. Maybe the person who is uh, projecting themselves to be the prophetess to be so powerful in uh, exhibiting like, the power of God. Uh, in, a, in a way, they think it is the power of God and they are uh, deceived into it mm. without knowing. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I can pass you, sir. Okay, good. Anyone else? Just say your thoughts. I mean, doesn't, I'm not saying we are all perfect. We just, just want to know, you know what we're thinking. How could that happen? They have tolerated such a thing and allowed it to continue without hindering it. Mm -hmm. But why would they love that to continue? Why would they tolerate it when? Probably they were not that much strong to face it and to put it out of the chance. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were not, you know, they didn't feel strong enough, confident enough to confront that, yeah. Good, same? Uh, it could also be as a result of a lack of discernment, uh, not able to tell um, that this was a false prophet. And so due to the lack of discerning in the spirit, what the content of this woman was doing in the church must have led to them being tolerant of her. So mm. that being lack of discernment. Mm -hmm. I see Asha's comment. Um, they were not deeply rooted. The spirit was too influential. Mm. Good. Yeah. So I think um, you know we can put all of these things together and you know think about generally how something like this would happen. Uh, a, a person coming in. Uh, in this case, of course, it was a, it was a prophetess, but it, um, like I said earlier, it could be anybody. It could be a man also. But somebody coming in, uh, initially, they they're going to come in with a very positive influence, right? The, the, the like like we heard, uh, the prophetic influence, the prophetic gifting, and it doesn't have to be just the prophetic. In this case, it was the prophetic, but people can come in with all kinds of influence, and they bring that in. And uh, initially, it's going to be very nice. People are going to welcome it. But at some point, the, the influence then begins to take them in the wrong direction. In this case, uh, she was seducing people into immorality and idolatry. And the effect of her teaching was actually pushing people into the depths of Satan. And that's when, you know, we have, like we heard, we have to be very discerning. And hey, what is it? So I want to just cross-reference Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5, where in the Old Testament, God gave uh, uh, you know, the real test of a prophet. The first test he gave is this. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams is speaking something to you, and even if the word comes to pass, but he is taking you away from God, 
then reject him. So the real test of a prophet, the first test of a true prophet is not whether his word comes to pass. The first test of a true prophet is, is he moving me towards God? Right? So that's what we have to look at. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, is you know, is what he's saying, right and accurate and so on. So we must always evaluate ministry, any kind of ministry like that. Is this moving me closer to Jesus or is it taking me away from Jesus? Now, taking us away from Jesus could, you know, it doesn't mean that today they're going to say, you know, go and worship this thing or worship that thing. No, it could be maybe sometimes they put themselves in the place of Jesus. That is taking away from Jesus. Right? And so we are caught up with the influence of that individual instead of that individual pointing us to Christ himself. So we need to have that uh, discernment. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, Sri Kumar, I'll come to your question. I just want to answer this uh, Louise question here. Where do we draw the line between controlling or protecting the household of faith? That's a good question, right? So uh, I could just share my my approach. I'm not saying this is the right approach, but the approach I've taken is I, I don't control anybody. So I don't control, you know, what people read or where they go or in the sense of, hey, if you want to go attend a conference, go do it. You know, you want to listen to any preacher, that's fine. I mean, you want to read a book, you read a book. You know, I'm not here to get involved in any of that. But so I personally don't interfere. I, you know, I don't even, we don't even waste time on Sunday talking about any of these things. But what we do, the approach we take is just to minister the word of God, just to minister the truth. And, uh, uh, and if people are established in the truth, they will be able to discern error. Right? The rationale is very simple. You know, if you want to recognize the counterfeit, and there could be many kinds of counterfeit, the best way to do that is to become very familiar with what is real, what is genuine, right? The more you know about the genuine, the more you can quickly recognize what is counterfeit. So if we establish people in the truth, it will help them quickly discern error. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't dictate to people who to listen to, who not to listen to, unless they come and ask me, right? Uh, recently, meaning maybe about a month ago, one family came and asked me about a certain minister. I just said, you know, I don't want to say too much, but you'd be better off staying away. That's all I said, you know, because I knew that ministry and I knew what, you know, the kinds of things they've done. So that's all I said. So I'm not controlling them. I'm just, if they, if they come and ask, I will tell, you know, in a polite way what I think. But otherwise, I don't go around controlling people. That's the approach I take. Now, some, some, somebody may use a different approach, but I, I think whatever is relevant and useful for you, the, the people you're serving, uh, that, that, that would be appropriate. Right? Uh, yes, Srikumar, you yes, have sir. a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, I just want to know that um, when we say about the idol worship, uh, maybe uh, is it also possible that uh, where the, they they make the people to uh, worship them uh, rather than worshiping any any image or something like that. And one more question is, uh, I just want to know that uh, initially we will not able to understand that this this is a wrong teaching, and um, it 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 will take a lot of time for us. Maybe um, uh, when we start hearing the messages, such kind of, no. Um, that will uh, we will not able to understand that the uh, you know the the spirit behind it, and so how we can able to identify uh, that initial in initial stage itself because uh, maybe we will feel that um, this is also the gospel what they are preaching because the revelation what we are hearing is something which is very uh, very um, like it's very deep and something like that. So how we even in that even at that stage how we can able to uh, uh, identify that no this is something wrong this is this is something leading us away from the from the truth of God and mm. the third thing I just want to know sir uh, that nowadays I don't want to take anyone's name but I just want to know that nowadays um, the people just uh, you know 
uh, they I believe on the, the the spiritual father spiritual sons but sometimes they worship the spiritual father uh, more than Jesus or something like that so uh, is it is it true like you know we have to like uh, more focus on the spirit I I really appreciate I I also submit to my mentors I I surrender my life to because of the the they are they are my mentors so uh, I submit to them but when it says that no you have to uh, you have to replicate them you have to uh, you have to you know uh, you have to just uh, you know bow before them and um, you cannot listen something else and uh, in that case uh, how we will uh, how how we can put these things with uh, with the teaching what we learned right now yes thank you sir that's three things. okay so first question yes you know anything that replaces takes the place of god is an idol and uh, if i make the 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 the, the, the preacher the person who's ministering uh, and let that person take the place of God that that becomes an idol to me right? we, we as ministers uh, we've got to direct people to the Lord and not to ourselves so the answer to answer your question is yes it's possible that uh, that person may have placed in this case the prophet Tess could have placed herself as in the place of the Lord uh, or it could also be the pra practice of idolatry the Second question is, how do you discern early on uh, that some teaching is wrong? So I think, uh, practically speaking, one is we ourselves need to be you know, well-grounded in the Word of God. So that when somebody is saying something to us, our question must be, does that hold up with the entire teaching of the Word? Right? So that's, our, that's, that's how we should be thinking. Um, don't because when you take something in isolation like if that person is taking a verse or a passage and is expounding and, and, and you know, it, it may sound very convincing but our question must be does it hold up to the entirety of scripture right um, because scripture must be balanced out with the rest of scripture especially in, in terms of new testament doctrine so on so if we are well grounded in the word then we can quickly discern hey that's off because you know look all these other scriptures are contradicting the end point of what that person is bringing out this he that person he or she may be reading the scripture and explaining something but what they are saying doesn't hold up with other passages in scripture right so it, you know we have to weigh it in the light of the rest of scripture so that's the first thing we must be very well versed you know well versed with the with the scriptures ourselves and so that we can evaluate everything in the light of the entirety of scripture second is the anointing of the holy spirit the holy spirit dwelling in us teaches us all things so john wrote first john chapter 2 verses 20 and also verse 27 he said the anointing in you teaches you all things so if the anointing is really speaking through that person and giving and that there's a spirit of truth coming then the same spirit of truth is in me and he will bear witness but if it's something he's bringing out, out of his own mind his own you know mental something he made up uh, something he's gotten into off, off into error the anointing in us who is a spirit of truth is going to you know tell us so we need to be sensitive to the the, 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 the what, what's, what's happening in your spirit you know is there some is there a connect then you can receive that otherwise you know uh, you can say that's wrong and many times the Holy Spirit will alert us so that's where uh, the discerning of spirits comes uh, you will see that okay this person is off there's a there's error in what is being said uh, uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, awakens us the third thing is this that you know uh, doctrine this is in Hebrews chapter 13 doctrine is compared to food and bad doctrine is compared to bad food so what happens when you eat bad food you know you have a stomach upset and uh, you know just doesn't sit well and uh, all these things happen so this is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9 you know uh, strange doc strange doctrines is compared to bad food right so Hebrews 13 verse 9 so that that's the third test is okay what is the effect of that doctrine in your life you know is it like good food or is it like bad food uh, 
good food will strengthen you, will help you become stronger like and be, grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Bad food is going to cause all kinds of problems in your life, right? So when the doctrine is wrong, it's like eating bad food, wait and see the, for the effect of that doctrine on the person's life. Is that okay? Just three simple tests? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the last question uh, is, you know, there is there is the right and the wrong to spiritual fathering or spiritual mentoring. Uh, spiritual fathering, spiritual mentoring is a biblical thing, right? We are called to pass on to others what God has given to us. You see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament. You know, uh, in the Old Testament, you have good examples like Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha. And God's promise in Isaiah 59, 21, he says, what's on this generation, the anointing and the revelation will pass on to your children and to your children's children. So there is that pass on, passing on. New Testament, the examples of Paul and Timothy, Paul and Titus, Paul and the uh, several other young men in whom he trained in Ephesus. You read about all of that. So it is there. However, the basic thing is this spiritual fathering or spiritual nurturing the goal is to make other people grow up to be mature be fathers and mothers the goal is not to control the goal is not for that person to remain your son forever and ever no that the goal is for that person to become another father in the lord you know no earthly parent gives birth to a baby expecting the baby to remain a baby forever and stay under their shadow no Every earthly parent gives rise to children and gives birth to children and expect the children to become parents themselves and be independent. That's the objective, right? So I personally do not, you know, I don't subscribe to and I don't in any way appreciate uh, the misapplication of spiritual fathering and mentoring that we see in some places, you know, where people... Just say, oh, that person is my spiritual son. And okay, yeah, okay, they're spiritual son. Know, but, you know, why, why don't you let them grow up and be, be their own fathers and mothers, you know? Why do you always have to, uh, you know, have a rubber stamp on their lives? You know, uh, let them be who God has called them to be. And so uh, I don't appreciate some of these things that we are seeing in the Christian church where uh, there is so much of control and so much of, you know, like you said, sometimes the so spiritual father, mother replaces Jesus himself in the lives of the people. So while there is the true, the good practice of it, the wrong side of it can be very dangerous. But this is nothing new in the church. You know, so the problems we see in the church, they keep on repeating. They keep on repeating. So if you go back in time, uh, you go back to the 1980s, the same problem happened. In those days, it was called the shepherding movement. You go back in time uh, to uh, that of, uh, I think it was uh, Watchman Nee, Witness Lee during those times. Again, you had some similar problems happening. So these problems keep on coming back in cycles. They just keep coming back with different labels. Right? Today, they, we call it, you know, who is your spiritual father? In the 1980s, they used to call it, who's your spiritual shepherd? Who's your shepherd? You know, and they called it, they, they, they packaged it differently. The problem was packaged differently back in time. So it's the same thing, keep on repeating. So if, when you study church history, you understand, hey, this problem is not new. The same mistakes that were made in previous generations, people are making again today, just packaged differently. And so we need to have enough understanding uh, to take the good side of it and then practice it correctly. You know, so the goal of spiritual nurturing or mentoring is to nurture people and let them become what God wants them to become. There's no need to put labels on people and control their lives and you know those kinds of things. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I know we got sidetracked a little bit, but let's get back now. Chapter three, uh, did we answer every question? I think we did. Okay. Chapter three, uh, Revelation chapter three, let's go. Verses one through six, please. Revelation three, one to six.
Please, please go ahead. Revelation chapter 3, verse 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardius read, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then, what you received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Uh, yeah. okay. um, yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed as white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Okay, thank you. So, the judge in Sardis, um, the Lord presents himself as the one with seven spirits of God and seven stars. Seven number of perfection seven spirits doesn't mean there are seven holy spirits but he is perfectly anointed by the spirit of god he has the perfect anointing seven spirits perfect anointing and the seven stars we know the seven stars represent the seven angels the seven messengers he's got the leaders of the churches in his hand the church in sardis you know is in a very dangerous spiritual position so what, what do you mean it says i know your works that means they've got things going you know they're doing works they're, they've got a lot of ministry going the ministry that's happening has given them a good name he says you have a name that you're alive that's worse too but in reality the church is dead so this is such a dangerous spiritual place to be because ministry is happening you have your works and everybody's saying good things you have a name that you're alive people are saying wow that church you know that community is they're so powerful they're so anointed they're so alive they're full of life because you're seeing all the works that are going but the Lord Jesus is saying, you are dead. That is very, very tragic. Because the reputation they have is they are alive, they are a living, dynamic church, and they're having all these works happening. And the Lord is saying, you're dead. And why is that? Because he says, verse Verse 2, the latter part, I have not found your works perfect before God. They have works, but it's if, if you want to paraphrase it, it's not the works God wants them to be doing. I have not found your works perfect before God. This is not what I want you to be doing. So they've got a lot of good things going good in the sense of what people say is good right so people say wow look at that church they are doing this and they're doing that and they're doing that and they're doing that but the lord is saying that's not what i want you to be doing your works are not perfect before god and so he's telling them you're actually dead Because they've lost their connect with God. And so they're no longer doing what God wants them to do. But they're doing a lot of things, none of which, or most of it, is not what God doesn't want them to be doing. It's, it's not what God wants them to be doing. And so the Lord is calling them back in verse 2. He says, look, be watchful and strengthen what remains. 
that means there are a few things that are really the things God wants them to do. But he says, you've got to be careful, otherwise even those things will die. And basically they'll be left with doing things that God is not really wanting them to do. Very strange, a very dangerous place. And verse 3, he says, here's the key. Remember. Remember what you received and heard. In other words, the church had a very good beginning. The church was given the right start, if you want to put it like that. You know? They started right. What they had received, what they had heard, that was really good. So when they started, they started 100% right. What they heard and received. So if you want to say it, you know, uh, whomever came here and started this church here in Sardis, whoever to a team, very likely people who were trained by the Apostle Paul would have come. They would have started this church. Um, and uh, everything started right. They were doing the right works. So the Lord is calling him them back to what their origins were. Remember how you received and heard. I'm looking at verse 3. But what happened over time is they, they left that original DNA, so to speak, what they were given. And they started manufacturing their own things. And what was from the original decreased. So there were a few things that remain, but they're also ready to die. And now they're doing so many things that are not what God wants them to be doing, but it's giving them a good name. It's giving them a good reputation. People are saying, this church is alive and all of that. And the Lord's saying, hey, you guys are dead. Because you're doing, you're, you're, you're doing things which I don't want you to be doing. And what you need to do is to get back. Remember what you received, what you heard. Get back to that. And repent. Repent of you know, just doing all these things on your own. Right? And if you're not, then he says, you know, I'll come to you like a thief in the night. But then he also commends them, which is, I think, in connection with the things which remain. Verse 2, in verse 4, he says, you know, there are a few people. They haven't defiled their garments, meaning they are walking in purity. They're walking in truth. So from that, we can infer that some of the works they're doing is actually compromised works. Because he's commending the people who've not compromised. They've not defiled their garments. They are walking with me in white. There are some. There are some who stood the test so he's recognizing that and then he's promising them his reward you know they will walk in garments of white uh, uh, and i will not take their name out of the book of life i will confess their name before the father so i mean we can spend a lot more time talking about this i i'm trying to finish chapter three which i don't know if i'll be able to but let's see but you know uh, this is something so important. And I see Elisha's question. How can a local church secure itself from falling into the serious spiritual state? So I think a lot has to do with the leadership. That the leadership must be careful to stay with the things which you have received and heard. That means stay with the origin, stay with the word of God, stay with the truth of the word, stay with the sound teaching of the word and the sound living and practicing of the word. The Now let's translate this to today's time, to 21st century. 
in our day and time, there is a lot of pressure to do a lot of fanciful things. You know, uh, in how you preach and what you preach and the content and so on. And when you look at some of the content that's being preached in churches, it's like, where is the word of God in this sermon? You know, sometimes you wonder, like, okay, it's it's a very exciting sermon, maybe it's a good talk. But where is the teaching of truth? Where is the word of God? Where are we uh, are we establishing people in this in the sound teaching of God's word? Are we establishing them in you know in the things that God wants them to be established? Or are we just giving a nice talk that makes them feel good? Uh, maybe address a few things here and there, but where are where is what is the how far are we or how close are we to staying with the word of God? So this is a big challenge in the contemporary church, you know, where uh, are we really establishing people and the things we have received and heard? The tendency is to just, you know, to go away from the, the basics, to go away from, you know, what we're supposed to be teaching and preaching into things that appeal to the masses. So the answer then, and, and this is something, I mean, I, I would just say personally, is uh, to make a conscious effort just to teach the Word, you know, even if it means that I am preaching the same thing over and over again, it's okay. Because every time you open the Bible, it reads the same. So you're preaching the same thing. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. The Bible reads the same every day. I, of course, of course, we will have fresh insight and fresh application, but we are reading the same scriptures. And we should never get tired of that. We should never get pressured to let that go. Stay with the Word of God. Stay with the move of the Holy Spirit, with the work of the Holy Spirit, the way it is revealed to us in Scripture. We will be safe. And let ministry come out of that. Let ministry be an expression of that, rather than just doing some things for the sake of doing. Is that okay? Any questions before we wrap up? I know we didn't finish chapter 3. I um, hope we'll close finish Revelation before the end of the semester. Uh, okay, I think we will. Any questions? Pastor, can I ask one question? Yes, go ahead, please. So um, when we when we talk of a church uh, not uh, giving the right doctrine, so recently uh, last week we were talking uh, from Second Timothy chapter three, where they say they have a form of godliness but they deny the power, and we were discussing that uh, there are churches who are not flowing in the gift of the Holy Spirit. They do not uh, believe in the power of gift of tongues and and many other things, and they they uh, ignore the third person of the Trinity. So, uh, can we say that they are also teaching a wrong doctrine, or uh, you know, uh, how do we, you know, look at that kind of a church where the third person is completely neglected? They have good theology; they may be teaching good sermons about Jesus, about the Father, but uh, when it comes to Holy Spirit, and they have ignored uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. So, mm -hmm. uh, does that church also fall into the category of um, teaching uh, not the correct doctrine kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll try to answer this very quickly. Uh, so, one is, see, sometimes it could be maybe they just don't know, but. Uh, not knowing is, I think, in today's world, not an acceptable excuse because there's so much of uh, teaching and uh, you know information already available. So, uh, no church could say, "Oh, we did not know about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit." I don't think that's a valid excuse anymore. Uh, 
uh, because there's so much of uh, teaching already available. Uh, so it it cannot be ignorance, but it probably is an intentional uh, disregard to the work in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, maybe because of a denominational position. So I think the first question is to check where this particular church or is, you know, is it because they're really ignorant or is it because of an, they're intentionally disregarding it because they belong to a certain denomination so on. Or sometimes the, the, the sad thing could be they actually oppose it uh, because again of their denominational position. Uh, if it's e either the second or the third, then it is always good for people, especially those who are who have been enlightened about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, then to to move to a church that that will help them grow in the things of the Spirit, and and that particular church, which is in the second or the third position we mentioned, you know, let let God deal with them. You know, uh, how God is going to deal with them, we will let the Lord decide. Uh, uh, but would they be Part of this Second Timothy three category, I would think yes, because they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power, right? Especially when they are in this third category, but they are active, actively against the work of the Spirit. They are denying the power thereof. Right? Now, uh, so we have to, you know, just say, okay, uh, you know, I, I need to position myself differently and grow among a people who are open to the things of the spirit thank you so much Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. okay let's um uh let's uh, just close in prayer and we will dismiss um and uh, we will uh go for a break could somebody please pray and dismiss us precious father we thank you praise you honor you god father Thank you, Father God, for this precious revelation and the precious truth what we received. Father, we pray that, Father God, let this enlightenment, O oh, Father God, Lord Master, never taken away from us, but let we able to depend and let we grow in it, O oh, Father God. And Father, let our understanding be, Lord Master, let it, our understanding be sharpened and enlightened more and more, so that we can able to, Lord Master, live a life which pleases you, my King. Father, let these words what we learn today let it guide our path so that father we can able to finish our race oh father god which is given unto us we can able to finish our assignments which is given unto us oh god so that we can able to stand before you as a faithful and a fruitful servant of god once again i am thank you father god for your servant of god we ask you father god fill him with your wisdom more and with your strength more father god so that he can able to be useful for your kingdom more and more thank you father god for each one of us that you have spoke to us O oh god and you have removed our darkness of oh father god you have filled us with that light of knowledge of oh father we give you all the glory honor and praises in jesus name we pray amen and amen thank you pastor man thank you everyone um we'll see you in the next class god bless bye now thank you pastor so much thank you thank you so much